we flew from California to Hawaii, and then we got another plane in Hawaii and flew to Okinawa and stayed in Okinawa for about one day. And from there, we flew to Da Nang, Vietnam, uh, actually sitting on the floor of a KC-130, <laughs> no seats, oh, sitting wow. on the floor. They flew us into uh, Da Nang, and from Da Nang, I got a helicopter to go to Dong Ha, uh, which is near the DMZ, the North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese border. Well, very interestingly, when I got to Dong Ha, I went to the uh, the commander of the base to report in. And <clears throat> he happened to be on the telephone at that time with the commander of the base at Quezon Combat Base. And he was talking to him and I don't know what their conversation, I wasn't there for the entire conversation, but during conversation, he said to the Quezon commander, commander uh, so you need an intelligence specialist. <laughs> I wasn't really an intelligence specialist. I was an interrogator translator. That, that's what I was trained in. Oh. But it has an intelligence MOS, military occupational specialty. So he said, okay, I've got an intelligence guy right here and I will get him to you. <laughs> so uh, about 20 minutes later, I was on a helicopter and they brought me to Quezon. I'm assuming that before you get on the plane to go to Vietnam, you're aware of what's been happening in Vietnam. I imagine, you know, you've heard of Quezon, you've heard of the Battle for Way. Um, you've probably seen Walter Cronkite's reporting and all the other news reports at that time. As the war is heading into its most intense phase, um, you can't know that you're you know that you're heading there for the most intense phase but but at that time but you must have had a strong sense of what was going on in south vietnam before you actually got there yeah so, i did from all of the news reports yeah I, I had a pretty good feel for what was happening there so what was your own disposition toward this as you're getting on the plane to make the series of flights that eventually gets you to da nang not knowing that you know in one day, you're going to go to Dong Han, then to Quezon. What was your own thinking about going into um, the conflict in Vietnam, which at this time was incredibly intense? Well, my original expectation was I was going to be assigned to an interrogator translator team. Uh, that's what I was trained to do. <laughs> yeah. But circumstances brought me to Quezon with an entirely different focus on what I was going to be doing. All of a sudden, I wasn't an interrogator translator. I was an intelligence analyst, which is a, a totally different animal. And when I got there to Quezon, I, I reported to the commander. Uh, actually, I was... Uh, so I was attached to the 26 Marines. Um, just to back up a little bit, interrogation translation teams are assigned to wherever they are needed. So we may be assigned to different units at different times, depending upon what is going on. But we report directly to headquarters, uh, which at that time was Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. And then they decide what's the best place to use our interrogation translation resources. So again, I was I was expecting I was going to be assigned to an interrogation team. Well, it just so happens that they had lost my orders on, on, on me going over there. So that's kind of how I ended up uh, being an intelligence analyst uh, in Vietnam. Wow. And uh it, it, it all happened so fast, honestly, wow. that I didn't have any great expectations or fears or anything like that going into, into Quezon. 
uh, I guess until the helicopter pilot turned around to me as we were landing in Kesa that he said, when I set this helicopter down, you get your ass off and you go jump behind those sandbags. Wow. So <laughs> that's when I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was your first impression of Quezon? I mean, what did it just what did it look like in April 68? Well, it was so there was first of all, there was nothing above ground. Nothing. It it, it was it, it was just like totally devastated. Okay, because at that point. This is the end of April. Tet started at the end of January. So they had been bombarding the combat base every day. I'm talking about the North Vietnamese. They had been bo bombarding the combat base every day for like three months. And honestly, there was nothing, nothing above ground. Everything was in bunkers underneath. Uh, the Marines had dug these big bunkers for everything that was going on. Uh, so when I got there, uh, I just asked somebody, where's the where's the headquarters bunker? Because that's where I was supposed to be assigned. And so they pointed me and they said, get over there, but get over there real quick. Don't, don't be exposed out here too long. Uh, so yeah. my impression of Nissan was it was a, it, it was a it was an unforsaken place, totally surrounded by mountains, like the worst location you could ever put a combat base, mm. because the enemy enemy would just sit up in the mountains and just lob artillery and mortars and everything into the combat base every day. What recollections do you have of the Marines themselves? I mean, you have a sense of what's been happening, but you haven't been there yet. You, right. you haven't been there. You haven't experienced the, the bombardment. The You probably are going to experience this. You're probably, you know, you're going to experience the rats and everything else you hear about in Quezon, but you haven't experienced it yet. Um, how would you describe right. the Marines that you interact with first when you're talking to them? What kind of shape were they in? What was going on with them? Uh, Marines are tough, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, attitude really doesn't change that much depending upon the circumstances. So everybody that I met there was still very upbeat, uh, very gung-ho, uh, Nobody was disappointed or anything like that. Uh, you know, they were they were just still raring to go. Wow. It's, it's good to see. Yeah. How long were you there before you actually started to do the intelligence work? Did you have a day or so to kind of, you know, do in dock and and get used to the place? No, they pushed me right into it. Uh, when I when I showed up at the command bunker, uh, the commander was there, and he said, "Okay, this this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be tracking the enemy location." So it, there was this real there was this big map on the wall, and it had all these overlays on the map, and the job consisted of getting all of these reports from the field. Uh, we had microphones out in the field to listen to what was going on. Wow. Uh, we had overflights over the area that would pick up infrared from bodies and stuff, and campfires and stuff like that. Uh, we had uh, prisoner war reports, which is actually what I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what we would do is we would plot all of these on an overlay and then put it on the map. And once you got all this stuff on the map, you could see clusters of information and you could pretty much know where the enemy was, what units were there, what their strength was. And I, I just dove right into this. I had, uh, you know, another uh, Marine that was there and said, okay, this is what we do. Uh, and he just step by step led me through it. And that was it. Just go. I mean, it sounds like you're describing gathering information to determine where in this area surrounding Quezon the NVA are 
grouped and and therefore where to send um you know air send air resources against them and also artillery from the base itself right that's what uh, that's what intelligence work is all about finding out as much as you can about the enemy to know uh what the size of the units are where they're located and as much as possible what their plans are uh yeah yeah you know the more information you have like that the better you can deploy your resources you know and uh, from the information that we gathered that was sent to uh the pilots who did the b-52 strikes so they would know where to do that um we would know where to send our reconnaissance patrols uh, to check out the enemy, you know, yeah. to see exactly where they were located and how many there were. So, you know, that's that's what military intelligence is all about. We had these microphones that kind of looked like uh, tall grass, elephant grass. They were disguised as elephant grass. Wow. But they they were actually microphones. And uh, an airplane would fly over an area, would drop, I don't know how many, a number of these microphones into the, you know, just drop them out of the plane and they would stick in the ground and they would record <clears throat> anything that was passing close by. So, for instance, we heard tanks rumbling. We could actually hear this in the command bunker at Quezon. We could hear the tanks going by. We could hear them talking to each other. And that was one thing. Um, another thing was the infrared. And the infrared would pick up like campfires. And we knew that for each campfire, they would have approximately 20 soldiers huddled around the campfire, you know, cooking their meals, keeping warm, that kind of stuff. So from the infrared reports, we could kind of determine how many enemy soldiers were there. Uh, we also had something, believe it or not, it was called sniffer reports. Airplanes could fly over and they could actually detect body odor, okay? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the stuff really far out there yeah <laughs> so that that was another one and of course the uh the pow reports uh, they were very informative because you could get all this information but if you didn't have the pow reports you wouldn't really know what unit this was you would know that there was a large amount of troops in a certain area but you wouldn't know you know what is this like the 818 battalion? Is this the, you know, 808 battalion? Which one is it? And that's what the POW reports would do. They would give you, they would give you that information so that you could identify exactly who was where. Wow. Uh, and then, of course, every time they, there was any kind of a uh, uh, military action like air to ground our our guys engaging with the enemy ground troops they would give us reports uh you know we spotted a group of 50 and fired upon them so again that narrowed down for us how big these units were so yeah. that that was basically it and then we got teletype reports uh and that then the teletype reports came in from the field and they and uh, they contained all kinds of different information. Uh, for instance, rec reconnaissance reports. Uh, the uh, South Vietnamese Army actually would parachute uh, some reconnaissance teams into North Vietnam. We weren't allowed to go in there. But the South Vietnamese would send some of their guys into North Vietnam. And they could kind of disguise themselves, obviously, right. as, you know, North Vietnamese. Right. So we got a lot of information from them, too. So what you, that, that was big. Would reports sometimes come in from special forces as well? Sort of the the SOG folks who might be in Laos or, or in North Vietnam? Did you remember? No, we, we, no we, didn't, we didn't really get much of that information. Okay. Because... Uh, 
I don't think we were really supposed to be doing that sort of stuff. Right, right, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, it was very highly classified. Um, yeah. You said that with the microphones, you know, the technology you're describing is really remarkable. I've heard that the odor uh, technology from the air would pick up urine and perspiration and, and those sorts of smells. Is that right? Mm -hmm. so that's that's remarkable. And then these microphones that are being dropped and and you you said that um, sometimes you could hear the NVA forces speaking as a result of your yeah. training. Were you able to understand what they were saying? Well, it it wasn't really clear because there was some distance between the microphones oh. and the conversation, but I could pick up a word here or there, but oh. nothing of consequence. It's funny that you mentioned rats earlier. I was in Quezon for only a month uh, because uh, one night while I was sleeping, I got attacked by a rat, believe it or not. Wow. I got bit by a rat. They had no rabies serum at Quezon. So they had to medevac me, medical evacuation, to Dong Ha, back to Dong Ha, to the hospital there. And I went through three weeks of rabies shots every day, uh, which they give you in the stomach, by the way. <laughs> I think it's changed since then, but back then, <laughs> that was the that was the rabies vaccine you got every day in the stomach for three weeks. <laughs> so that's how I that's how I got out of Quezon. And when I got to um, Dong Ha, I was still serving as a uh, intelligence analyst there until they finally found my orders. <laughs> and this was in June of uh, 68. They finally found my orders and they transferred me to an interrogation translation team. In Da Nang. So you spend a in month in case on this rat bites you at night. Did it bite your toe or bite your finger? Got your my finger. I woke up and there was a rat, actually it was this hand, there was a rat hanging off the end of my finger. Oh my so I was totally, I was totally freaked out. I did something really stupid. Uh, I grabbed my rifle and I tried to shoot him. <laughs> Unsuccessfully. Holy but I scared the heck out of my, out of my uh, bunker mate. <laughs> And he said, you got to get over to Charlie Med right now, the medical team there in Quezon, he said, because you could die from that. So, so that's what happened. <laughs> what impact does being under daily artillery bombardment, what impact does that have on a person or on people? Now, you said that Marines are resilient, and so... We don't have the image of them, you know, sort of cowering, obviously not. But it's hard to believe at the same time that being under daily artillery bombardment, underground a lot of the time, hearing the artillery come in, it's hard to imagine that mm -hmm. that doesn't have any kind of impact on a on a person. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the impact of being not just under an artillery bombardment, but being under daily artillery bombardment mm -hmm. for week after week after week? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that happens, you develop a strange sense of humor and also a, a, a strange sense of business as usual. Uh, mm -hmm. We knew every day at 10 a.m. we were going to be hit by artillery. And they, uh, for some reason, that's exactly what they did. And so, I mean, we would, we would like look at our watches. It's like, okay, time for artillery. And, and sure enough, the, the, tiller, the artillery would start coming in. Um, so you develop like defense mechanisms, a lot of defense mechanisms to deal with the stress. Because obviously it's a very stressful situation, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So you develop these these ways that you can that you could deal with this. And, and another thing that I learned right away is that 
in a very short amount of time, you can learn to distinguish incoming artillery to outgoing artillery. It actually sounds different. And so every time you heard something, uh, you if it was if it was outgoing, it's like, okay, that's outgoing, you know. If it was incoming and you heard it coming in, you knew you had a certain amount of time uh, before it would actually land. And so that helped also uh, so that you weren't not awaiting this. You know, you, you weren't, you were anticipating. You know, once you heard it, you know, okay, here it comes. Here it comes. You know, so get into your bunker. Could you just summarize this um, period of, uh, did you say a few weeks in Dong Ha where you're getting the rabies vaccinations because you were bit by the rat? Um, how, how do yeah. you, Apart from the the shots themselves, um, yeah. how are you spending that time in Dong Ha? What are you doing during that time in Dong Ha? Yeah. I actually enjoyed Dong Ha because I was in uh, an underground, huge underground air conditioned bunker, and I was in there with the with the command. Uh, we had the command for every unit that was in there. Uh, G1, G2, G3. We actually had some. Uh, we had some uh, Army Airborne guys. That the command structure was in there. Um, we actually had some CIA analysts that were in this with me. Really? So uh, I was basically doing the same thing. I was plotting everything on a big map. Uh, the one difference was that I was actually doing a briefing for the commander every day. So it's like. The six o'clock news for me every day. I'd stand up there in front of this map and say, okay, we've got intelligence reports. We heard about this and this and this and this. So based upon this information, we think this unit is located over here, point on the map. This unit is located over here. And, and the, the commander was sitting like, you know, 10 feet away from me, listening to all of this, you know? So like I say, it was like the six o'clock news. Yeah. Very interesting. I really enjoyed that. And they wanted me to stay there even after I got my orders to go to the interrogation translation team, but they couldn't pull that off. I had decoded the name. There was a combined interrogation center in Da Nang that had um, interrogators for Army, uh, Air Force, and Marine. We were all there together, and Arvin. Uh, you know, the South Vietnamese interrogators were there as well. Uh, honestly, the Air Force didn't do much interrogating. They just took our interrogation reports. But the Army and the Marines and Arvin did most of the interrogation. So we were, we were situated right next to a prisoner of war camp in Da Nang. And so they would bring us what they thought were important uh, POWs to be interrogated. Okay. And so we would do that. Um, every day we would be interrogating somebody. Wow. Uh, if they were a good source of intelligence, if the interrogation might last one or two or even three days if it was a, a really good intelligence. But um, a lot of the guys that we were ending up in Tele, they, they were just kids. I mean, really kids like 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, and the majority of those were the Viet Cong, okay? Um, when we got a, a North Vietnamese army regular in there, that was a whole different thing because the Viet Cong weren't educated at all. Uh, the guys who were coming in from North Vietnam, Nam, they were better educated, they had better intelligence, uh, they were a formal military unit as opposed to the Viet Cong that would just kind of slapdash together in a unit. Uh, so anyway, that's wow. that's what would take place at the Combined Interrogation Center. But when I wasn't there, we would be assigned uh, to where, wherever they thought we were needed. So I did a lot of operations out in the field with like the 26 Marines we would go on operations with them so that if they happened to capture anybody on an operation, 
they could bring them to us and we could interrogate them right there in the field uh, wow. right after the end. Yeah. So that was a real important source of information to the field commanders because it was like on time, real time intelligence. So that's what, when I wasn't at the Combined Interrogation Center, I was on a number of these operations uh, in and around Da Nang. Was your Vietnamese good enough so that, I mean, the entire interrogation was operating in Vietnamese or at times would you speak in English and then have it translated or was the whole thing going on in Vietnamese? It, it was in Vietnamese. The whole thing was in Vietnamese. Now, occasionally, uh, we'd have a uh, an Arvin interrogator sit in with us uh, just to monitor what intelligence was being gathered. But a lot of times, I, I was by myself doing wow. interrogation. Wow. When you think about just focusing on the Viet Cong, um, is there a particular interrogation that especially sticks out in your mind, or if there are a few, if you could select one, what would be a, uh, an interrogation with a Viet Cong that just sticks in your mind for whatever reason? Well, one that was interesting is that uh, one of the Viet Cong that was captured was supposedly working for us. <laughs> but a lot of this went on. They would work for us one day, and then they would work for the Viet Cong the next day. So, you know, I just remember this one guy. We kept capturing him. He kept coming back, and then he'd leave and he'd go work for them. You know, so there was a lot of that stuff going on, and mm -hmm. the Viet Cong weren't really that loyal to anybody like the nba was you know uh they were they were loyal to whoever happened to be in charge that day <laughs> so that's the one thing that sticks out about the interrogations of being gone how about with the arvin with your arvin counterparts did you feel that you could rely on them did you feel that they were um uh folks you could have confidence in yeah, well, the the Arvin that I dealt with, they all had the same MOS as I did. They were they were interrogators, okay, and we did a lot of training with them too to make sure that the Geneva Conventions were being adhered to and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was really close to a lot of the Arvin interrogators, uh, and I, I forget who I was talking to, but I told somebody just the other day, you know. You know, I often think about what happened to these poor guys after we abandoned them, you know, because these guys were, these guys were uh, well-educated, a lot of them. They were teachers, they were business owners before the war. And, you know, I developed some close working relationships with these guys. And I trusted, I trusted everybody that I worked with. They were some really good guys with really good intentions. Now you just mentioned training, Geneva Conventions training. So I wanted to ask you about the techniques um, that you mm -hmm. use and then still wanna hear about the NVA and still wanna hear about your operations out in the field. Um, what were the techniques that you would use? And one of the things I'm, I'm guessing is that you would maybe shift techniques depending on the personality of the person you're dealing with um, yep. and other factors. So what were, you know, generally, what were the techniques that you'd use, interrogation techniques? And then what's an example of how you might need to use a slightly different technique with this person for personality differences or some other reason? Sure, sure. Well, if you've watched any police shows on television, you probably see a lot of the techniques, okay? Mm -hmm. Like good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Everybody knows what that one is, okay? Sure. Uh, that was one of the techniques. One of them was, uh, we already know everything anyway, so you might as well just answer our questions because we, we already know it. We already know it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, or another one was... Uh, Listen, the war is over for you. You know, you could go back to your family now. So 
you know, just tell us what we need to know. And, you know, you can get back to your life as it was before, you know, mm -hmm. or, or just simple things like uh, sleep deprivation. Okay. You know, your, your will to resist deteriorates the longer that you're awake. And then uh, whatever techniques you try, you, you really don't know exactly which one is going to be the one to work. So you have to like run through them one at a time until you find the one that really does work. And the reason you could tell if it works or doesn't work is that as you're doing your interrogation, you're collecting information. And so you keep asking the questions, asking the questions, but after five minutes or so, you go back and ask the question that you already know the answer to, but you ask it in a different way mm -hmm. to see does his answer this time match up to what he told us earlier? If it doesn't, you got a problem. <laughs> okay. Right. If it does, then you verify that your interrogation technique is working. I see. So um, that's what we did. Would they sometimes start out, you know, sort of the classic movie image anyways, you start out offering the the captive a cigarette or something like that to sort of establish rapport and would they often start that way? It's funny you mentioned that because that's how I picked up a very nasty habit of smoking okay. <laughs> because we would offer them a cigarette and then it just uh, out of habit, I would light one up myself, you know, so I didn't quit smoking until I got back from Vietnam, but we would give them uh we would give them soap and uh, toothbrushes and toothpaste and little things like that. Mm. Yeah. Kind of induce them to open up to us. And, you, you know, you try to establish a rapport. You don't go in like the tough guy, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you over the head until you give me the information I want. You, you go in, you try to establish a rapport, try to get the buddy, buddy thing going as much as you can, because, that way they're more open to your questions. Just guessing what percentage, and here we're focusing on the VC still, um, what percentage would you say were, you know, either right away or within some time were generally cooperative with you? Would you say it'd be 50%, um, 40%, something like that? Believe it or not, close to 100%. Wow. Uh, you know, the U.S. military, we we have a policy. If you capture its name, rank, and serial number, they didn't have that policy. Okay, they would pretty much tell you anything you wanted to know. You know, because I I get questions a lot from people. Oh, did you ever have to beat them or throw them out of a helicopter? It's like no, no, I never saw anything like that. It wasn't necessary. They would tell you pretty much anything you wanted to know. You know, it was a it was a totally different mindset between them and the American military. Um, the NVA was a little bit more disciplined than the Viet Cong because they they've had military formal military training, so they were a little bit more reticent. But the Viet Cong, forget it. They tell you everything. How would you generally describe the NVA? They're going to have different personalities and you're going to have different interactions, but what would be your general description of the NVA prisoners that you interrogated? Well, they were very well trained. Uh, there was something that was called a political officer that was assigned to every NVA unit. Every evening, these guys would sit around the campfire and the political officer would give them indoctrination about what they were do what they were fighting for, you know, why communism was so great. <laughs> you know, th these guys were these guys were this was drilled into them, you know. Oh. You're fighting for the good of your country, you know. Uh, the communist philosophy is the best philosophy that there is in the world. And so, and they were very well militarily trained as well. 
Uh, I mean, uh, our guys would much rather fight the Viet Cong than fight the NBA because yeah. they had discipline, they had tactics, uh, and and they knew exactly how to operate as a unit. There's a you know question that arises: Was the primary motivation from the North? Was it um, communist ideology? Is that the primary motivator? Was national nationalism the unification of the country under the leadership, of course, of the North? Was nationalism the primary motivator? What's your assessment? Um, you're talking about how these guys have been politically um, indoctrinated. You know, they're they're being this is being reinforced daily. When you're thinking about the individual NBA soldiers that you're working with, would you say that they were, generally speaking, ideologically committed communists? Were they committed nationalists? Um, where are they coming from as individuals? Uh, nationalism much more than communism. Uh, they felt like Vietnam is their country. The whole country was their country. And uh, the United States was an invasion force that wanted to take over the country, uh, steal all of their national resources, and uh, basically just run the whole show. So yeah, these guys were uh, devoted to uniting the whole country. Um, when you think about the NBA, prisoners you interrogated is there um one particular prisoner who stands out in your memory for whatever reason either just the way this this prisoner carried himself conducted himself something he said there are actually a couple um one was a he wasn't really a prisoner he was a defector uh, we had a we had a program was called chiu hoi Right. Uh, which means uh, friendly relations. And if these guys uh, came over to us in the Chi Hoi program, uh, we could get a lot of information. And so there was this one, he was a political officer, which I already told you oh. what they do. Uh, he came over to us and he had all of the plans for a second Tet offensive a year later. 1969, it was planned, uh, but it was planned only for uh, the Da Nang province. It wasn't going to be as big as 1968, but they were going to try to pull off the same thing in Da Nang. Well, he, he came over to us and he pretty much gave us all the plans <clears throat> for this happening. And it never happened. And I think the reason it never happened is they they found out that he had like spilled the beans on everything. And so there wasn't a Tet Offensive in 1969. Wow. So that, that was the first guy. Uh, the second guy, uh, he was just an, an average uh, NVA soldier that came in. And it's, it's part of every interrogation. We always ask them at the end of the interrogation, have you ever seen any American soldiers in North Vietnam? And believe it or not, this one guy said, yeah, I saw this one guy, this pilot, he was shot down over Hanoi and crashed into a lake. And we actually had a photo book of all of the American pilots who had been shot down over Vietnam. So I asked him to go through the book and see if he could identify this guy. And he pointed out this one guy. At the time, I had no idea who this guy was. Okay. <laughs> John McCain. Oh. <laughs> he pointed out John McCain. He told me where the where they were being held in North Vietnam. Okay. And so it wasn't until after I returned to the United States that I found out that we had attempted a rescue attempt at that facility in North Vietnam. These prisoners, if they gave you information that checked out and that was useful, would they be rewarded in some way? 
to encourage them to share? Um, maybe we would give them some extra soap, toothpaste, cigarettes, you know, give them a pack of cigarettes, okay. you know, stuff like that. So you also will go out with Marines into the field then and and talk to folks um, in villages. Um, so could you just, you know, generally um, speak about that, sort of what these operations were, the sorts of things you would do? Sure, sure. Yeah, these were, you know, the, the operations again were uh probably planned in accordance to the military intelligence that we had received uh and someone whoever made these decisions felt that we needed to do a major operation in a specific geographical area and so for instance the 26 marines would be sent down each one of these operations had a name like bold mariner or something like that you know yeah. they, they were all given names and so uh i would go out uh with them i would accompany them and again if they happened to uh capture anybody i would be right there to do the interrogation and, and to give them real-time information and uh i'm not i'm not saying this to brag or anything okay but yeah uh, i was awarded the bronze star with a v for valor and after the operation was over uh the commander came up to me and he said you saved a lot of my guys lives today with the intelligence that you gave to us and that meant more to me than any bronze star combination could ever be. So I'm nope. very proud of that. Yeah. So was this information that you gathered, this was kind of real time information. Somebody told you something that was related to something that might be coming up in the next 15, 20 minutes, that sort of thing. Right. Exactly. Are you able to, to talk about what that was? Well, one of the pieces of information on, the, on that particular operation that I remember is that uh, they had planned an ambush to ambush our troops at a, at a specific location. And so when I found that out, I relayed that immediately. So we, have, we avoided walking into a trap right there. Wow. Uh, and was this yeah. a villager who pulled you aside or did were you just casually talking to somebody and that person told you how did how did you get that information well this was a prisoner they had captured this prisoner oh, i see okay. uh and so he, he came to me and you know i just did the interrogation as usual and he told me a few other things uh he told me where there was a huge b-52 crater uh and he said you don't want to go there because the crater had filled up with water and he said your guys could drown in this crater if they have if they try to go through there and, and a few other just bits of information like that you know. there were a few other operations you know where i got information like that uh uncovered a lot of uh weapons caches where they had stored weapons uh uncovered uh, a lot of underground tunnels you know rat holes that they used to hide in yeah. so just you know there was always stuff that you could get from these prisoners uh, in an interrogation which would help you real time right there right on the field as your 13 months in i is winding down um, what was your assessment, either whether you're thinking about it in, a, in an explicit way or whether it's just sort of a gut feeling you have, what was your assessment of the war and how it was going? You arrive in, in early 68 or the spring of 68, so you're out in the 
late spring of 69. You've described a general difference. These Southern fighters, these VC, uh, seem to lack a, a degree of commitment, certainly compared to the NBA. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in Vietnam during the most intense year of the war. Um, mm -hmm. By the late spring of 69, what was your own assessment of how things were going? Well, after Quezon, after Tet of 68, Viet Cong were pretty much wiped out. <clears throat> there wasn't uh, there wasn't a whole lot of Viet Cong activity after that. And we had the feeling that the war was going to end soon, right after Tet. But then there was an attitude change. Uh, back here in America, okay? We felt a whole lot of support before Tet from Americans at home. Yeah. After Tet, that changed. That, that really did, the attitude really changed after Tet. And I think, you know, Cronkite famously declared that we couldn't win the war. And I think he convinced a lot of people that we couldn't win the war. And so a feeling of optimism that we had in 68 uh, kind of evaporated towards the end of that year and going forward, uh, 69. Yeah. And I'm not one to question the tactics of generals, but none of us could understand why we weren't taking the war to North Vietnam. We were, we were fighting a defensive war for the most part, where we all felt that we could have gone into North Vietnam and ended that thing pretty quickly. Uh, we had overwhelming forces, overwhelming technology. Uh, everything was on our side, but we were kind of fighting with one hand or both hands tied behind our backs. And we made these crazy decisions. I don't know who made them, but we couldn't go into Laos. We couldn't go into North Vietnam. Laos had the Ho Chi Minh Trail. All the supplies were coming from North Vietnam through Laos into South Vietnam. We could have gone into Laos and ended all of that so that they wouldn't have the supplies that we need, that they needed to do that. I didn't mention this, but when we were when we were at Quezon, uh, there was a mountain complex in Laos, which is, I don't know, 15, 20 miles inside the Laotian border. And they had these huge artillery pieces inside these mountains. They would roll these artillery pieces out, fire on Quezon every day, roll them back into the mountains. We couldn't get them with airstrikes because they were well hidden in the mountains. And the policy was we couldn't go into Laos and get rid of them. So we were sitting ducks here because of a policy that we couldn't go after these guys. And I mean, this is just my personal opinion, okay? We could have gone into North Vietnam and ended this thing and it would have had a completely different outcome. So it sounds like your view is when we look at Tet, um, it was an overwhelming military defeat for the North. As you say, the Viet Cong were uh, decimated. Um, mm -hmm. But then you mentioned, you know, Walter Cronkite famously for the first time decides to editorialize, says that, you know, this is a stalemate. We're not losing, but we can't win. Not long after, President Johnson says that he's not going to run again. He looks looks like he's giving up. He's not going to run for re-election. So it sounds like your view is that Tet was a military victory for the U.S. and its allies, the government of South mm -hmm. Vietnam. But it took a psychological toll um, that led to a change in the states that then had an impact on the forces in Vietnam. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. It was a it was a military victory 
and a psychological defeat for us. And uh, everything changed. Everything changed after Ted. Really did. I, I mean, think about just think about Kason. Okay, we were sixty five hundred guys at this little combat base, surrounded by twenty thousand. NBA troops, they were massacred. They had like 85% casualties, the NBA did, okay? And it was a military victory, there's no doubt about it, okay? You can't have 85% casualties and say you won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just can't do that. So yeah, yeah that's, that's what Chase. 68 was the change in, in Vietnam. But what the American public is seeing, they're seeing the film and the photographs of the artillery coming in, of the Marines running around the base. And what, in fact, is an unfolding military victory feels like a defeat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Let's put you on the plane. The, the plane has taken off from Da Nang and you've left Vietnamese airspace. I don't, you know, sometimes vets say the pilot will come on the intercom and say we've just left Vietnamese airspace. I don't know if that happened in your case or not. Um, whether the pilot does or doesn't say that, what's your own, what's your own disposition? Um, what's your own thinking about the past 13 months? I was happy to get out of there. Okay, I had a very unique experience, <laughs> as anyone who hears my story will tell you, a very unique experience in a very unique job classification. Uh, I had some memorable encounters over there, uh, I had some uh, memorable incidents of what took place while I was over there, but I just wanted out at that point. And so I was really happy to get out of there and to come home. 